Don't worry, I'm not going to start singing. Jesus. Hello. Today I'd like to talk about the fatal flaw in remote sensing. In fact, it's really the reason that remote sensing can't really be used operationally uh, to estimate things like forest carbon. But it's, it's going to be a complicated one because it's one of the more sophisticated things that I've tried to explain on this, this channel. And honest to God, most remote sensing scientists don't even understand the problem themselves. Put simply, put simply, when you create a forest carbon map, or, or any map of the forest, and then try to draw a polygon around an area and get an estimate of forest carbon for a particular property, there's no real good way of knowing the uncertainty around that estimate. So you can create a map, you can draw a polygon, you can take the average carbon inside that polygon to get a number of how much carbon there is, but there's really no way of, of saying how right or wrong that is. And you can see how much of a problem that is if you want to actually use this map to make, you know, management decisions or to actually issue forest carbon credits. And so, to understand why that is, I think first we have to deconstruct how traditional forest inventories work. Traditional forest inventories are a statistical sampling of a population. And so if I have a, a property, for example, uh, what I will do is I will go out and measure some subsample of that property, let's say maybe 10% of the area, and I'll do that in a series of plots. And so for each plot, essentially, I'm measuring biomass on that plot. Then I'm looking at all of the plots and I'm seeing how much biomass differs from plot to plot. And then we can compute confidence intervals from that uh, if we basically compute the amount of variation between plots and then take into account the number of plots that we've measured. So for example, if we measured more, more of the area, then our, our uncertainty goes down. In fact, if we measure all of the area, uh, we have an uncertainty of zero, right? Because we've measured every tree. This is called a census. All right, so that's how the tr traditional forest inventories work. Why does that not work with remote sensing maps? You know, most people who are looking at these maps will, will say, okay, we've mapped out all the trees in, in our area, uh, therefore our uncertainty is really low, right? Because we've got this remote sensing model, it's made estimates for every single tree, uh, it's super precise. And in a sense, that's, that's kind of right, right? I mean, you could miss the biggest trees in, in a traditional forest inventory by just not putting plots there. Uh, and so you could be re really far off. Fundamentally, this is not the correct way of looking at it. And this is where a lot of remote sensing people or, or people who aren't familiar with the field will really get caught up. Because what they'll do is they'll assume that every remote sensing estimate made inside that property uh, is itself a separate sample. And so a lot of the times the way that people will go about trying to compute uncertainty for an area is just to divide by the number of predictions made. And this is enormously flawed. For one thing, you know, we're, we're segmenting these areas up into tiny little pixels on a map. Uh, and so maybe there are 10,000 pixels inside of your forest project. If you're actually just dividing the, uh, the variation divided by the, uh, the square root of the number of pixels, you're going to get an obscenely small uncertainty. And I have seen, you know, professional remote sensing scientists try to do this and, and more or less claim that their uncertainty is, is practically zero. I, I read a draft of a document put out by Quantum Spatial recently that made this claim. It is completely wrong. And, and you'll find that this is wrong if you actually compare this to, to a number of inventories. You'll, you'll realize that the area level uncertainty for your project, you know, it's higher than zero, of course. It, it's so, something like, you know, 5, 10, 20 percent, depending on how good your model is. So why is that the case? Well, first, let's talk about how remote sensing scientists deal with uncertainty. You know, every remote sensing paper that you'll read will report uncertainty, but what they're actually reporting is the plot level uncertainty when they're validating their model against the plots that they trained them on. Now, what do I mean by that? Remote sensing models are trained using a set of forest inventory plots. 
right? So maybe you've got 150 plots, you're setting 50 of them aside, you're treating the model on 100, uh, and then you're validating the model on those 50 plots. Now, from, from those 50 plots, you can say things like, oh, our model has root mean squared error of uh, 20%, uh, or our, our model uh, has, a, has a bias of, of 5%. And that's what's reported in, in all of the remote sensing literature. That's all remote sensing scientists care about. That's all they actually ever disclose. But that doesn't tell you how good your map is actually doing in an area. That doesn't tell you how good your map is doing across 10,000 pixels. That only tells you how good your model did on average at estimating a single plot, at estimating a single pixel. So, so why is this a problem? Why can't we just take the, the model's error and assume that if we apply the model to 10,000 pixels that the error will kind of level out and that the more pixels that we apply the, it, the model to, uh, the better it's going to do, and that if we apply it to 10,000 pixels, then the model's going to be perfect. Well, the problem comes down to an issue called spatial autocorrelation. The model you see, all remote sensing models, are trained on a large, sub, a large population. So, for example, maybe you've trained a remote sensing model for an entire ecosystem, uh, and you've trained it across several states worth of data, and it's a really great model. If you then go to apply that model to a, to a project area, to, to a single little property that you're interested in, the forest in that property doesn't represent the forest of the entire ecosystem. The forest in that property is, is going to be different, right? Maybe it's a, like a sugar maple stand that's only a subset of the population. And this is where the problem comes in, because in traditional statistics, we assume that the errors level out. We assume that, all right, for maybe for this pixel, uh, we're underestimating by five, and for this pixel, we're overestimating by five, and this pixel, we're underestimating by five. And so we assume that if you take an, a ton of pixels or a ton of plots, uh, the uncertainty goes down. But the errors don't actually level out if you're making predictions on a subset of the population that you train the model on. Or, you know, if you're making predictions on, uh, you know, a, a property that potentially only has sugar maple trees in it. Uh, and so what do I mean by that? Maybe your model uh, will consistently underestimate in sugar maple stems. This is potentially really problematic because you've applied a model that has been trained to the entire population of uh, several states uh, to only a sugar maple stand, uh, where you only make underestimates, and maybe your, your model on average underestimates by 5% in sugar maple stands. Uh, if this is the case, then you know if you've got 10,000 pixels inside your model area, you're probably going to be off by 5%, not by some tiny minuscule number. Uh, and, and so to illustrate this, let me point out this, this figure right here. This is a predicted versus observed plot. Uh, it's a plot showing a pretty good model, right? Uh, and so the one to one line here is is when the model is is uh, the one to one line is is when the model is exactly right. And things that are below the one to one line indicate that the model is under predicting, and things that are above the one to one line indicate that the model is over predicting. You know, across the entire population, across the the entire area that you trained your model on, and on all the the test plots that you withheld, your model may be really good because it predicts a little under here and a little over there and a little under here. But if you're going to make a prediction on a single property in that region, a single area consisting of like a couple thousand pixels, then you've got a real problem because potentially all of your errors are clustered uh, you know, in one specific spot on this on this one-to-one -one line. Maybe they're clustered in, in an area that consistently under predicts. So statisticians and scientists, they really, they don't give you all the information that you need to actually make uncertainty estimates with their remote sensing models. And really, I, every single map that you come across here, if you try to use it to actually make an estimate on an, on an area, uh, you're not going to be able to say how, how certain that actually is. Now, there are kind of two solutions that I've seen bandied about there that are potentially able to deal with this problem. Uh, the first is just overwhelming amounts of data. And really, the kind of data that you need to actually get to the bottom of this is you need areas. You need like thousands of, of actual areas, like forest carbon projects or, or, or properties that have traditional inventories in, inside them. And, and then you can compare the estimates made by your model in those areas to the estimates made by the, the actual forest inventory. And then you can say, you know, for an area of this forest type that's 100 acres large, 
on average, we get an uncertainty of 7%. Now, in reality, nobody has that data. You know, the only people who really have that data are like forest you know, timber companies, and they don't share that stuff. Uh, the other solution that I've seen to this involves extremely complicated Bayesian statistics. And, and basically, you know, what you need to do is you need to create some sort of Bayesian process model. And, and the nice thing about these Bayesian models is that you can make multiple predictions, and then you can compute the correlation matrix between each prediction. And so you can say that, OK, all of my predictions are correlated to one another, and therefore, all of my errors are kind of going to be the same. We've got this, this bias of error. Uh, and therefore, we can make up for that and kind of say what the uncertainty actually is. Uh, these things are very difficult to get right. Uh, I, I've known people who have uh, you know, trained these models, and, and they still get very low uncertainty because uh, not enough information is going into the, the correlation matrix for it to, to really say whether or not you know, these pixels are correlated. Uh, and so it's really difficult. There, there are only a handful of scientists in the whole world who are really tackling this problem right now. You know, some of these folks include Chad Babcock and Andrew Finley at the University of Minnesota. And they're, as far as I'm concerned, they're the only people who are really working to make remote sensing work as, a, as an industry, as a field, right? Now, I've also seen some remote sensing maps come with built-in uncertainty. And I'm sorry to say that most of the time, these uncertainties are, are not useful for actually telling you the error in an area. So a common way, for example, to, to compute uncertainty is to take the prediction of the model, and, and maybe the model has some, some confidence intervals around it. Maybe the model is, for example, random forest, and you happen to know what the quantiles of prediction were for the random forest prediction. That's great. You can, you can turn that into an uncertainty for a particular grid cell, for a particular prediction. But again, that's no different than the uncertainties we were talking about before, where it's plot level. And that doesn't tell you what the uncertainty is in a set of correlated pixels. And so, I mean, I know this is one of the more and more technical talks. But, but ultimately, uh, this has been used as an excuse for, for the reason that remote sensing can't be used to estimate forest carbon. And, and they're absolutely right. This is the killer, right? Because if you're, if you're actually issuing forest carbon credits, you need to know how off you are. You need to say, all right, this is, this is my estimate, plus or minus 5%, and then you're going to be conservative and not issue 5% you know, of the credits. That's the only way it's going to work. So this is, this is really the issue that plagues all of remote sensing. And if you ever have a criticism of, of new fancy remote sensing technology, this is where you should uh, target it at.